Okay. What do ducks wear to dances? What do ducks wear to dances? Any ideas? Duxedos. <laughs> Remember where the source of these are on occasion. <laughs> Why was Tigger looking in the toilet? <laughs> He was looking for poo. <laughs> that was one of my favorites. <laughs> they laugh and giggle for hours. <laughs> if you don't understand the joke, ask your difference. <laughs> so if you look at the syllabus, this exam, this first exam, is going to be over everything through this lecture. And then when we come back after the exam, we're going to be launching into hypersensitivity and autoimmune diseases. Okay. Now, <clears throat> that portion is still considered part of this adaptive immune system, but that's a lot of information for exam one. So I try, I straddle exam one a little bit before the exam and a little bit after. Okay? So this picture here is a scanning electron micrograph of what type of cell? Any ideas? It's a lymphocyte specifically. Okay. We're going to be dealing with B and T lymphocytes today. The leukocytes that we spent time on were part of our inflammatory response. And the lymphocytes, we have two families. We have B and T <coughs> lymphocytes. So we classify this as our third line of defense. So just to remind us, our first line of defense was what? Barriers, like what? Give me some examples. Skin. Skin. What else? Mucous membranes. What else? Air. Air. Okay. So, physical barriers that protect us from the elements. Now, our second line of defense, which is still under this category of our innate immune system, meaning that you're born with it and it doesn't change, it's the same every time, was called what? Inflammation. And we spent quite a bit of time in inflammation because it's a major tenet of this semester. A lot of the diseases that we look at uh, involve inflammation and some variation of inflammation. Now, our third line of defense we call our specific immune system. Or another name for it would be the adaptive immune system. So I'd probably write those two words down because they are used interchangeably. Specific because the response that you generate is tailored like, exactly to what the antigen or the trigger is. So it's going to be uniquely different than a different type of virus or a different type of infection. Uh, adaptive because even when you get infected with the same virus the second time, there's a little bit of an adaptation that's taken place with your immune system. So the response adapts to where you are particularly in that exposure. And we'll talk about like vaccinations. That's why we get vaccinated. There would be no reason to be vaccinated if this system didn't adapt. Do you understand that statement? Because if you gave yourself exposure to an antigen and there was no adaptation that took place, there would be no benefit to having a vaccination. So we generate what we call a memory response. We'll talk about that in both the family of B and T lymphocytes. So we have two major types that are shown here. We have uh, cell-mediated, which is shown on the far right, cellular immunity. The cell-mediated response is dominated by CD4 positive cells and CD8 positive cells. Now, what the heck are CD4 and CD8? Does anybody have a definition for us from the readings? What, do we talk, what is this language that we're speaking? They are two different transmembrane proteins that are found in different types of cells. So the CD designation, any other, someone else is chatting, any other additions to that? Okay. So CD stands for cluster of differentiation, that's the designation. 
And so it's a transmembrane protein that ha it's a cluster of a, a number of different subunits, and I'll show you a picture in the next slide. And there's a number of them that we've identified in the field. These two happen to be designation four, numerical four, and numerical eight. Now, for example, there's a, I don't know how many they are, but there are at least 68 CD proteins that have been identified. The reason I know that is because we use one in my lab to tag activated macrophages. Activated macrophages turn on a transmembrane protein known as CD68. So CD68 is just one of these, but it's number 68 in the discovery lineage. So I know there's at least 68. I, I would imagine there's probably hundreds that we've discovered. Okay. These were two that were found very early, as you can tell, by four and eight numerically. Okay. We'll talk about what those clusters do here in a little bit. And then our second category over here is called humoral, also known as antibody-mediated. And the reason it's referred to it with two different names is these are cells that actually manufacture or they, they crank out antibodies as a product. And that's a protein. And unlike their counterpart, the cell mediated, the T cells, the T cells actually attack. The B cells crank out antibodies that help propagate a reaction or a signal. It could stimulate phagocytosis. It could stimulate neutralization. It could stimulate an inflammatory response, and we'll look at all three of those here throughout the lecture. Well, it's referred to as humoral because these antibodies circulate in the blood or in the humor. Right? Early on in the study of the body, we talked about four humors. Early on in history. We don't really use that terminology anymore. But blood was one of the four uh, liquid mediums within the body. It was a humor. And so that's why it's considered humoral immunity, is this antibody circulates in the humor of the blood, and it can be um, systemic. That's a term that means throughout the body, not just in a local area. Okay? So you can see from the diagram that we're going to classify and characterize both of these types of specific immunity our humoral or antibody, and also our cellular immunity on the right. So let's look at the level of the, the, the membrane. At the level of the membrane, here down on the bottom of the screen, you have a cell that's expressing um, a CD4. And this CD4 is a transmembrane protein that's associated with this entire cluster of proteins. That's why we call it cluster of differentiation four. And the cluster of proteins has these chains, these gamma chains. It has these alpha and beta uh, T cell receptors. And then it has these C3 transmembrane proteins that have three subunits that are also associated with this entire architectural structure. It's big, sitting inside the membrane. Up on the top is a second cell. This is an antigen presenting cell. And we'll talk about what those things are here momentarily. But these antigen presenting cells find an antigen and they show it off. And you can see it shown off right here. And the antigen presenting cell is utilizing a transmembrane protein on its surface known as the MHC complex, MHC class two. So MHC class two presents to CD4 positive cells. That's a match that you need to be familiar with. MHC class two presents an antigen to a CD4 positive T cell. And when it presents that antigen, it presents it to its receptor, which is this T cell receptor, TCR, with an alpha and a beta subunit. <clears throat> and it utilizes this CD4 as sort of like a docking <coughs> activator to say that you know, I'm going to present to the correct cell, and I've identified that, you know, I have this docking sequence that gives me clearance to do this. Why do we have all this regulation? Well, it'll become more obvious after the first exam, 
when we start talking about um, diseases associated with autoimmunity. Okay? Our autoimmune diseases that we look at, like um, diabetes type 2 or diabetes type 1, really, um, diabetes mellitus type 1, um, multiple sclerosis, um, <clears throat> we, we see rheumatoid arthritis. We see all of these being what we call leaky in the uh, terminology that will make sense in a moment, where we make these um, T cells to recognize certain antigens, and we want to be very creative about it. So as we create creative versions of the T cells to find all of these different combinations of antigens, many times we become what we call self-reactive. We make a T cell that reacts to our own tissue. If you let that T cell that is self-reactive out in the periphery, then it can go attack the pancreas and the beta islet cells. Then it can go attack the myelin, or then it can attack a collagen substance in the joints. Okay? So this is the basis for a lot of these autoimmune disorders that we're going to cover in the rest of the semester. So, a lot of controls, that's what this slide should tell you, is there's a lot of controls. In addition to the cluster of differentiation docking, which is where the antigen, let's pretend that antigen is a foreign antigen. That's a virus, okay? Or that's a piece of a bacteria, or a fungus, or um, uh, <clears throat> it's a foreign substance that has been infected into a wound. Well, not only do you want to be able to activate it, here is another control mechanism over here. This is a CD cluster known as 28 that's in the T cell, and then a series of CD clusters, either CD80 or 86, either one of those will have an affinity for 28. But the point is that this is what we call a co-stimulation event. So it's not enough that the antigen has an affinity for the receptor. It's not enough that the correct cluster of differentiation says, yes, you can dock, and I agree that this is a correct configuration. You have another backup mechanism that says, let's just make sure that this isn't some random accidental activation of this T cell receptor. And so you utilize a co-stimulation event, which we call signal number two. So signal number one is the antigen binding. Signal number two, or the co-stimulation event, is this interaction between CD80 or 86 to CD28. What does that mean? Well, do you remember like those old cartoons in the Cold War when we were worried about nuclear World War III? You guys remember that? And there was like, you know, it was like a giant red button that said launch the nuclear warhead. And then like the general would pull out a key. And then like the other, the president would have a key. They both put them in. They go, one, two, three, turn and the light would light up. That, that's what this is. This is a safety mechanism to make sure that you're going to activate this T cell to go kill something, and you really meant to do it, okay? So co-stimulation is important in order for that activation to be successful. Okay, now if we look over here, so this is specificity, these characteristics of the T cells is they're highly specific. They're highly regulated. And then later on in the lecture, we'll see uh, that there's memory associated with them. So they have a memory. There are memory cells, memory T cells and memory B cells, that actually adapt to the response the second time you see it. Usually what it means is the response is heightened, and it's actually faster. Okay? And I'll have a couple of clinical stories for you. On the right side, this is what happens with the B cells? Remember, the B cells are antibodies. Antibody mediated, <clears throat> humoral mediated, floating in the blood. Well, first off, you can see that they also have these transmembrane proteins. <clears throat> we always seem to draw these antibodies like this. I, I drew my best on the, on the screen here for you to look at. We'll reference this here in a little while. You can see that this IgM is binding antigen, just like what was found over here, or 
in a similar type of fashion. And this triggers a signal number one. Well, the antibodies also have to have a secondary signal known as a co-stimulatory event. But its co-stimulation actually doesn't come from upregulation of transmembrane-bound proteins. They can be controlled by the nucleus, right? So if this antigen-presenting cell became infected and then presented this antigen, it would trigger the nucleus to upregulate the expression of CD8. And so the antigen that it's presenting from inside of an infection is in combination with the nucleus saying upregulate the expression of CD80 versus an antigen just randomly floating by, binding to it, and then it going and binding to something else on accident. There'd be no CD80 expression from a nuclear upregulation. Okay? So that's how this guy regulates. This guy regulates it by saying, okay, if I have an antibody mediated response to an antigen, and that antigen has been harmful somewhere else in the body, there's going to be a general level of inflammation that it, it's like an amber alert, right? So you raise the level of awareness in the body by upregulating the expression of complement protein by the liver, pumping out more complement into the bloodstream so that an inflammatory response can happen really fast. So now the body's saying, I found this antigen, and the environment is saying that I'm under an alert because there's higher levels of complement. So now my signal one of my antigen, in combination with my signal two, heightened level of awareness, meaning complement is being produced at higher levels of circulating, gives me a trigger to say, yes, that actually should activate that B cell. Okay? So in both examples, you have co-stimulation. You just have it in slightly different ways because of the modalities that these cells use. So a couple of other things that I need to describe in detail is the CD4 positive T cell that we're showing here on your left. They bind to these MHC class 2 molecules. And MHC class 2 binding to a CD4 positive T cell there's, of the T cells, about 60% of them are CD4 in population. The other 40% are the CD8. The CD8s are considered cytotoxic T cells. That's the name we use. The CD4s have another name, which is called a <coughs> T cell. The reason the CD4s, like what's shown here, is considered a help, helper T cell is because they actually make cytokines that assist other processes. For example, these helper T cells, these CD4 positive T cells, will crank out cytokines to help B cells make antibodies. They may even help macrophages ingest microbes. Okay? Okay. Uh, CD4 positive T cells, or the helper, the helper T cells, are the T cell population that HIV infects. So, we won't get to HIV until after the first exam, but what, the seed that I want to plant is, with an HIV infection, the major problem is when the population of helper T cells starts to deteriorate and gets to a level that's too low, then your immune function becomes compromised, and that's when AIDS kicks in. As long as HIV hasn't infected CD4-positive helper T cells to a level that becomes problematic, patient just has HIV, they're just HIV positive, and they're in this clinical latency period with no real effects or clinical uh, sequela of AIDS. So we'll get there later. CD8 positive. It's not shown on this slide, but you can write it down on the bottom because we'll get there. CD8 positive T cells, they bind to MHC class 1, and this is only 40% of the activity. So it's a smaller percentage than CD4. They do make cytokines, the CD8s, but mostly what they do is they directly go and kill the infected cell. The helper T cells are a little bit more like politicians. They're not going to get their hands dirty. They're going to find a henchman to go do the dirty work. Okay? The cytotoxic T cells, it's like the mafia. They'll just go out there and pull the trigger. Okay? Okay. So 
Where do these cells come from? This is a busy slide. We'll walk through it. I'll stay here for two slides. These cells come from the bone marrow. That's the precursor tissue that gives rise to them. The B cells come directly from the bone marrow, and then they enter into the circulation. The T cells go from the bone marrow, and they make, they make a stop in the thymus. And they make a stop in the thymus to become what we call immunocompetent. Knowledge, knowledgeable, uh, knowledgeable about the immune system is what that would mean. They're not necessarily mature. They're immunocompetent. The definition is kind of a, a tipping point definition. What's the difference between immunocompetent and being mature? Mature would be if they're actively working. Immunocompetent means that they're ready to fight, but they may not be stimulated, okay? So, B cells, bone marrow. T cells originate from the bone marrow, but they stop at the thymus to become immunologically educated. And so you can see here, here's the bone marrow, the precursor cell, the hematopoietic tissue. It gives rise to red blood cells and white blood cells, okay? It also gives rise to lymphocytes. The T cells make a stop at the level of the thymus. So what is the thymus? Well, the thymus is a piece of tissue that's a pink gray color. It has lobes, lobulated, and it's, um, it sits right above the heart, kind of about right here, about right where my mic is. Um, it grows in childhood, and in adolescence, and uh, post-puberty, it's about the largest that it'll ever be. And then it shrinks. Yours is starting to shrink. Okay? By the time you're an elderly patient in your 70s, it's almost indistinguishable from surrounding fat tissue. So why do you think, and then I'll get to your question in the back, why do you think it grows... It's unlike any other organ, by the way, right? It grows and it gets the biggest when you're a kid and just in adolescence, maybe just after puberty, it's the largest, and then it starts to shrink. Why do you think that happens that way? What's that? Well, it adapts as you get older, I agree, and that's why it's growing, is you're being exposed to new environmental agents. Then what happens? Build your immune system as it grows. What's that? Well, so you have the memory cells. These would be memory T cells. The memory cells, by the time you're in college, or maybe just after college, you've been exposed to most everything that you're probably going to come in contact. All your vaccinations are done. Okay? Right? There's some folks that don't do vaccinations, but some people are starting to rethink that with the, the measles issue that's starting to circulate around. But if you have vaccinations, then your vaccinations are pretty much done. Now you just have to get them like every five or ten years, depending on what you need. Uh, you've been exposed to lots of things. You've had like five or six roommates, some of them super ill all the time, right? And so now you're, you know, you're immunologically knowledgeable. So as a middle-aged adult, it's not as necessary to have a big thymus, so it starts to shrink. Question. Yeah, those are ones that have been activated. Yeah, they're actually doing something, uh, performing an immune function. They are in an activated state, and if they're cytotoxic, and they're killing, yeah. if they're T cells that are helper T cells, CD4 positive, they're probably pumping out cytokines. Okay. And immunocompetent, they're not active, so they are not. They're ready to fight. They're soldiers, armed, ready to go. <clears throat> they're just waiting for someone to say, shoot. Where does that tissue mass go? It just gets resorbed into the surrounding tissue. <clears throat> it dies off a via apoptosis. So then, um, are CD4 and CD8 cells both T cells to the CD4 and the helper T cells? That's correct. CD8 and CD4 are both T cells. CD4 are considered helper T's. CD8s are considered cytotoxic T's. 
Okay. Um, so, what happens after you make them and they get to the thymus? Well, they have to mature, right? They have to go through an educational process, become immunocompetent. And so they go to what we call secondary, secondary lymphoid organs. So these would be lymph nodes or lymph tissue. So a lot of times in 202, I don't think we fully unpack what the lymph nodes are doing for us or what the lymph circulation is doing for us. Case in point, let me hear from you. What's the function of lymph? Filter the blood, okay. Fluid recovery. What's that? Fluid recovery. Fluid recovery. What else? I agree, yes and yes. Scan for infection. Okay. Now how? So you might get all that in 202, and that's all true. But you have the venous circulation that has fluid recovery, and it does it quite well. They arguably better, in my opinion. Okay. Filtering the blood, you might as well use the giant filter of the liver, which would be much more efficient than the lymph node. So what the heck do you have lymph nodes for in the lymph circulation? So it, it truly, go ahead. Well, it's also full of like debris and whatnot, and it, doesn't that attract uh, pathogens? So it's like, it has pathogens and whatnot in it? It does have pathogens, but it shouldn't. It only has pathogens because we live in a world that has pathogens, right? So for example, uh, the last time you had like a sore throat, do you remember, did, you, did your, did your uh, glands on the side of your neck swell up? Have you ever been sick and, and your armpit was tender on the inside of your armpit? Right? So there are lymph nodes in all these locations. And I know you studied this in 202. But what happens is these pathogens or this bacteria or these viruses, they get trapped in these filters in these locations. And that's actually a battlefield. That's exactly, I'm using a lot of military analogies because that's exactly what the immune system is. This is how we fight off foreign invaders, okay? And so we pick our turf that we're gonna go fight. We would rather isolate it in these certain regions than let it circulate all throughout the body. <clears throat> Here's one uh, common um, battleground that gets lost. <clears throat> How many of you had your tonsils taken out when you were younger? Raise your hands. Okay. Yeah. So ton tonsils are actually lymphatic tissue, and if the infection wins out in that location, then we a lot of times will remove that particular piece of tissue. And there's backup tissue, so it's not deleterious to the organism overall. But this is a picture of a lymph node, okay, or, of, excuse me, of the thymus. This is a picture of the thymus. And the thymus would be considered part of the lymphatic tissue. Okay, we'll talk about lymph nodes later. But in the thymus, these T cells go to this lymphoid organ known as the thymus. And we have the ability for these clones, we do this cloning of these T cells to make creative versions of them <clears throat> to bind to all sorts of different types of antigens that we might experience. And then we check them in the thymus. If they are not self-reactive, then we let them out. We let them out of the thymus into the periphery. And these would be immunocompetent T cells that are ready to respond. They're mature when they find an antigen. For example, here's an antigen presenting cell, presenting a non-self peptide, that's an important designation, to a, a T cell, and that T cell responds appropriately because that is a non-self, is another way of saying a foreign peptide. Okay, this is the, this is the arrow that's supposed to happen. Well, if we have self-reactive clones that we catch, upon screening in the thymus, then we trigger them for apoptosis. And we call that central tolerance. Central tolerance because we isolate it in lymph tissue, which is the thymus, and we never let them out. <clears throat> apoptosis, which you know, is a organized program cell death, so it's not messy. In fact, it's very organized that we can recycle those parts very nicely to make new cellular machinery. 
Okay, so we'd rather catch it early than later. Apoptosis. So here's an example of apoptosis that is beneficial because it prevents us from making something that reacts with our own tissue. So if it's reactive to self, then we signal it for apoptosis. Then the last category, and I'll get your question, is on the far right. Sometimes we have slippage where we have a leaky immune system. And it makes it out of the thymus into the periphery. And now we have a backup mechanism to try to catch it because you can imagine this is a big deal. The reason this is so important is if this is self-reactive, then we have an autoimmune disorder. So we have three possible ways to combat it in the periphery. We call this peripheral tolerance. Number one on the left is if these T cells that are self-reactive don't have a co-stimulatory signal, then we stimulate them into a process known as energy. Energy is a process where they just sort of do nothing. So without co-stimulation, you can see the CD28 doesn't have any co-stimulation like it did here. So this is actually stimulated into this energy cycle, which is a cycle that doesn't do anything. It wastes a little bit of energy, but that's better than allowing self-reactivity to take place. Second, um, we can, um, well, let's do, let's do second on the far right. So second on the far right is, this is a signal of apoptosis if we have activation that's taking place too quickly. So if we have a T cell that's out in the periphery and it becomes activated again and then again and then again, the body says something's not right. It shouldn't be activated that frequently. So let's just get rid of it. Trigger for apoptosis. Play on the safe side. If it's overactivated too frequently, it's triggered for apoptosis. Okay? Third, right down the middle. This is the least well understood pathway, that's why I saved it for last. And these are a special type of cell that we don't know as much about. They're called suppressor T cells, or another name for them on the figure is regulatory T cells. And they act to dampen the response. How do they know that they should dampen the response? We don't know yet. That's an area of research we're trying to figure out. So in many cases, these suppressor T cells, or these regulatory T cells, understand that it's a self-reaction. You can see that it has co-stimulation. It's not happening at an over-aggressive frequency. So it's got all the right signals, but for some reason, this T cell, this regulatory T cell, sees what's going on and says, that's self, we need to quiet that down. And so it suppresses the response. Again, the pathway that's least understood is that middle pathway. Okay, three questions. It's this one here, here, and then the back. So without the peripheral tolerance, that's just what it does not. Well, so if the peripheral tolerance fails to catch something, yeah, then it slips into an autoimmune disorder. Okay, and then the central tolerance is just going to have like the potential um, cell that could like, cause an autoimmune disease, the central tolerance is going to get rid of it in the Yep, it gets rid of it right away. All of this is happening outside of the thymus in the circulation, in the periphery. That's what we call peripheral tolerance. So that's if, for whatever reason, the self-reactive flow is somehow out. If they, if they make it out of the thymus, they were, they were released out of the thymus, and they were not caught by central tolerance, then you have these backup mechanisms out in the periphery. And these regulatory T cells circulate the bloodstream. Okay, Here and then back there. So when you said the cell is under the activation of use cell death, uh, you're saying that the uh, cells have like a, like a shot limit, they have like six shots and then you're going to trigger for apoptosis, or if it just gets triggered too many times. Too it's just a frequency. So the question is on the activation-induced uh, apoptosis, if the frequency of activation is too quick, then the cell is triggered, has a frequency switch that says, it's overly active. It shouldn't be behaving this way. You mean in one cell or multiple cells? It's the one cell. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so is that 
I can't hear you. So is that something that uh, you would say chronic inflammation or like chronic diseases would essentially be dying? Uh, no, no, no. This is independent of inflammation. These are lymphocytes. Remember, inflammation are monocytes becoming tissue macrophages, neutrophils, right? Those are the leukocyte side of the family. It's the lymphocyte side of the family. You'll see inflammation associated with a lot of these processes, but right now I'm just talking about the lymphocyte activity. Apoptosis happens up in central tolerance if it's self-reactive, and apoptosis happens over here as well if it's overly activated from a frequency standpoint, meaning the cell is being activated too frequently, then it's triggered for apoptosis in the periphery. For example, you said um, they're isolated in the tissue, Central tolerance means that it happens in the thymus only. Peripheral tolerance means it's made it out of the thymus, it's in the circulation, and you didn't catch it up here. Now you're catching it here, but you're using apoptosis in both processes under specific characteristics. Okay? When you say the cell is suppressed, do you mean completely suppressed or just yes. it's completely suppressed? Completely okay. suppressed. Yeah, these suppressor T cells turn it almost completely off. Well, energy means that it's doing nothing. This one is actually activated, and then it suppresses the activation. So if you measured these two different cells, you would see this one in an activated state, and this would be in an inactivated state. So that's the difference. The other thing that's interesting about suppressor T cells and regulatory T cells is with a lot of autoimmune disorders, right, there's a, there's a phase where it kind of ramps up, and then, there, and then sometimes it actually comes down, and then it gets aggravated. And so one of the theories around that is that the population of suppressor T cells is fluctuating. So when they're high, they're able to mute the response. When they're compromised, then you get these flare-ups. Okay. Um, for energy and suppression, is the body unable to cause those cells to go through apoptosis? Yeah, for some reason they don't trigger them for apoptosis. They sort of burn up energy and they never have a shut-off time. Good question. Okay. So <clears throat> this question of how are they activated? <coughs> Lymphocytes, they're activated obviously through antigens like we talked about. These antigens are going to bind. This is that previous picture that we looked at. They're going to bind to their respective receptors. So it's a T cell receptor or a B cell receptor if it's humoral. Now don't forget that there's a co-stimulation event, so there's a little white space underneath there that you might want to put an asterisk and say, remember, in order for activation to be successful under both circumstances, you have to have that co-stimulation event, which we talked about previously, which is this signal two. So if we look at the antigen presenting cells, there's a typo on the slide, I don't know what happened there, so I kind of fixed the slide. There was some text above this text that you should probably just cross out if you have an older version of the slide. I don't know when you downloaded it. So now this picture is what? What is that picture of right there? It's not the thymus. What is it? It's a lymph node. This is also lymphatic tissue. And we're going to talk about antigen-presenting cells, otherwise known as APCs. There are really three main types of APCs. We have B cells, we have macrophages, and we have dendritic cells. There are other cells that can behave at times as antigen-presenting cells. But these are the three main families that I want to focus our attention to. So you may read in the literature of other cells that can behave on occasion as an antigen presenting cell, but these are the three that are really specifically supposed to be doing these types of activities. So that's what I want you to focus on. The book talks about, some of the versions of the book talk about some of these other 
ones that have these characteristics. B cells, right? They can present antigens. That's what an antigen presenting cell is, is it takes an antigen and it shows it on its surface so that an activity will take place. Macrophages, so back to inflammation. If we back up to our second line of defense and we look at an inflammatory response of an infection and we see that there's a virus that was on top of this piece of wood and that splinter went into the tissue, into the dermis, and triggered this inflammatory response, these macrophages are going to gobble up all the debris in the region, including the virus. So components of the virus will be presented by these macrophages to the immune system and say, what do you think of this? Huh? What about this one? <laughs> that's what their job is, okay? So that's where the two systems do come into play. We have inflammation that we already covered. We have our adaptive or specific immune system. They do behave together well, and they complement one another. And so the macrophages can also find antigens and say, this is what I've discovered Look at what I found. So it can behave as an antigen presenting cell after it's done fighting off that inflammatory process. Dendritic cells. Okay, dendritic cells um, are a specialized cell type. They're um, rather fascinating. These dendritic cells um, oftentimes are called Mongerhan cells. And they're named dendritic cells not because of the way they relate to neurons at all. Do you remember the dendrites though on neurons? That's a word that actually means like branching. These cells have a branching like characteristic. Okay? I've got a picture that I'm going to forward to so you can see it. This is a dendritic cell down here on the lower right. <laughs> Dim the lights just so you can see it. So it behaves much like a macrophage. It's a macrophage like cell. It even looks like it. You see how it's all got all these branching architectural appendages? That's why it gets its name dendritic cell. It's also called a Lagerhorn cell. You find them at the level of the skin. Right? You find them at the skin because this is an epithelial border that oftentimes is very close in proximity to the outside environment where you can have an infection. So here's where the dendritic cell is an adaptive third line of defense is sitting within the first line of defense, which is your physical barrier. Right? So again, they overlap. You also find them lining the nose, in the nose epithelium. You find them uh, lining the lungs, the nose, the stomach, and the intestines. All of these epithelial tissues are exposed to the outside environment. It's very likely you're going to get some foreign invader coming across the epithelium. And you want these guys right here to find them. And this one is finding it here. And it's presenting it to a lymphocyte on the lower left. See that? So this dendritic cell is presenting. And in order to present, I mean, they're like on top of each other, right? That's how they do it. And it's showing it. Here's another picture of presentation. So we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. I want to back up one slide before we go to that one. But we've got our three main types, B cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells. And then we've got the super busy picture over here that we're going to come back to a couple of times. But let me just lay it out. This is a lymph node. Here you've got a dendritic cell coming in. Dendritic cells can present to either CD4 or CD8. When they present the antigen on the CD4 side, it triggers this activity. We'll go through all these steps in a little while. It triggers this activity to essentially create activated, or what we would call mature, CD4 positive T cells that circulate in the bloodstream. They circulate in the bloodstream, they can go out and they can do things. Or the antigen presenting cell, like this dendritic cell, can present to the CD8 positive T cell, the cytotoxic T cell. It also activates it, puts it in the circulation, and it does a number of different activities. So I just want you to understand the global process, and then we'll walk through the different steps here in a moment, okay? And we'll see this picture again, so it'll be familiar. So these antigen presenting cells, these are the three images of the three that we just talked about. This upper left is a B cell bound with a peptide antigen working as an antigen presenting cell. So here you've got your B cell right here, 
Here's your CD4 positive lymphocyte, or T cell, that's synonymous. And it is presenting to the T cell receptor. Here's your CD4, right? And you can see the co-stimulation is happening right next to it. Similar picture that we looked at before, just in a slightly different way of representing it. Upper right, the upper right is a macrophage working as an antigen presenting cell. Just like I described, it could be an inflammatory event, it finds something there. Here you can see the bacteria that was coating that splinter and you accidentally got a splinter in your skin and the macrophage is going to find the bacteria and it's going to present it on the surface. Okay, It's going to display it. It's displaying it and it's sending out cytokines or signals to say, you know, blowing a whistle, look at what I found. I need some backup right here, we got to clean this up. Questions so far? Yes? Is there any sort of uh, specificity as to what antigen it presents when the incubator? So it finds like a certain sort of antigen on the bacteria, like or just grass? Oh, oh, what? So as it, as it engulfs the bacteria and it kind of chews it up, it's going to express random peptide sequences. So that's a good question, an interesting question. We might get to it a little bit later when we talk about vaccination. So hold that thought. Okay. So if we look at the two different classes of MHC, this stands for major histocompatibility complex. These complexes are also referred to as the human leukocyte antigen, or what we call HLA. So this is what essentially makes you, you. Your major histocompatibility complex is unique to you. And there's really three main classifications. We typically only talk about the two. But all nucleated cells in the body will express these major histocompatibility complexes. All nucleated cells. Now, red blood cells begin nucleated, and then they get rid of their nucleus, right, during the maturation process. Platelets don't have a nuclei. So other than platelets and red blood cells, every other nucleated cell, every other cell in the body is nucleated and um, has major histocompatibility complex on it. This is the reason that blood transfusions are actually very simple to do. You're like, what? Well, as long as you're paying attention to a couple surface antigens, and you don't even have to worry about these. You have to worry about a surface antigen type A, a surface antigen type B, and then a rhesus factor, whether it's there or whether it's not. Right? And as long as you pay attention to those kind of three things, and every permutation of them, you can swap blood from one patient to another, as long as there's a match. It's not that simple when we swap tissue, because tissue is nucleated, has nucleated cells, and those cells have these surface molecules that are basically like a label that says, hello, my name is Rob. I belong to Rob. This is a Rob cell, okay? And yours are all unique. And so, like, for example, if you're going to do an organ transplant, which we will get to after the first exam, you're very unlikely going to find a tissue match. So you actually transplant the kidney, you transplant the heart, okay, you transplant the lung, and the patient goes on an immunosuppressant drug for the rest of their life. Okay? And we'll, we'll talk about that. It's a type 4 hypersensitivity that we'll get to. So I'm just pointing you into the future. But what we need to deal with right now, so this is the reason that transplant rejections are a problem, and this is also the reason that blood transfusions are actually so easy to do, relatively speaking. You're like easy to, well, compared to a, a lung transplant, a blood transfusion is a cakewalk, okay? So the MHC class one presents the CD8 positive cells, and the MHC class two presents the CD4 cells. And so if you donate a kidney to me, 
then my CD4 or my CD8 cells are going to see a 4 in the NHC class right away, and, and vice versa. Okay? So that's why it doesn't work well on tissue transplants or organ <coughs> transplants, where you have to be mindful of it. So this is the matching that takes place. If we look into some components of an antibody, and I'll turn on uh, the screen lights here so you can see this designation. Um, this is my chicken scratching of, of an antibody, right? And we've got uh, a couple of pieces. We've got the, the, the heavy chain, which is sort of this hockey stick structure. And then we have the light chain, which is the smaller piece on the side. We have the variable region, which is the top piece up here. And then we have the constant region down here. This meaning variable that it can change, this meaning constant where it stays pretty much the same. At the level of the variable region is where you can bind an antibody. That's our antigen, our, our antigen binding uh, site. You can bind an uh, antigen, not an antigen. This is an antibody. And um, then if we break this out, we can look at these two pieces as what we refer to as the FAB region. This is the binding region where the antibody actually has specificity for it. And this would be considered the crystallizable region, which is more of a constant region. And the reason that I'm explaining this is we can go through some class switching between the different types of antibodies. And when you class switch, you change it from one form of the antibody to another. You keep the specificity to the antigen, but then you allow for the binding of the crystallizable region to come to different effector cells. Okay? So it's a way for the immune system, from an antibody standpoint, to have greater diversity on what it can actually find and what it can actually do. Okay, so back up to the mainstream. These are proteins. Antibodies are proteins. They're protein molecules. They have these two regions that we characterize. We have this FAB region, which is where the antibody has an affinity for. We have this constant or this crystallizable region, which is kind of like the trunk. In antibody terminology, the word valence, valence is the number of antigen binding sites that's possessed by that particular antibody molecule. So the one that I drew here, the valence would be what? Two. Okay, you bind two unique antigens. There are five main types that we're going to get to here in a second. And some of their activities. Well, the antibody can be secreted, right? And as it's secreted, um, it can actually neutralize. We'll get to that later in the lecture, but it can actually bind to the antigen and render it ineffective. Um, it can go through this class switching that we talked about, where we can switch out these parts so that we can have greater affinity or a greater distribution. We can get to more regions of the body if it's a secreted type of antibody versus if it's just found on the surface of certain cells or circulating in the blood versus actually expressed on an epithelial surface. Okay, that's why you would want a class switch. You say, you know what, I found this, now I want to release this particular FAB region on a crystallizable region that I can actually put into the bloodstream. Then we will find it in more areas of the blood. Does that make sense? So it's kind of like you take this part off of the soldier and you put it on that part of the soldier to say, Go in, you go into the bloodstream, but I need you to find this. Here, take that. Um, we'll get to opsonization and phagocytosis. This is another activity of antibodies. We'll do that after the break. Um, they can help stimulate complement, and complement has activity in triggering an inflammatory event. So you're going to see that antibodies' activity is going to go hand in hand with our second line of defense utilizing or leveraging the complement system. So, and then memory B cells. You actually have the ability to manufacture memory B cells so the next time you see it, it's faster and it's heightened. 
and we'll talk about that as well. We'll get into more of these details. The details I want to show you right now, and then we'll take a break, is I want to characterize the five different classes. IG, immunoglobulin, is what it stands for. I M M U N O, immuno, G L O B U L I N S, immunoglobulin. So you have IgA, immunoglobulin A. You have IgD, IgD, immunoglobulin D. IgE, IgG, and IgM. And you can see the respective characteristics of them. IgA is a dimer. <clears throat> There's a couple of different subtypes. You find IgA type 1 high in the blood. You have IgA type 2 in a lot of body secretions, okay, like in sweat or in mucus, or in um, uh, the saline of the eye. IgD is a monomer. It's found in lower concentration uh, in the blood. It's found on the surface of B cells, and it's been shown to help activate basophils and mast cells to produce antimicrobial agents. IgE is also a monomer. Uh, it's the lowest in concentration in circulation. So if you found something, and you thought it was in the blood, you wouldn't want a class switch to an IgE if you're wanting to increase your ability to find it in the bloodstream. Does that make sense? Okay. IgE, though, um, is our allergy response. We'll look at that. It's classic type 1 hypersensitivity. When you have an allergic reaction, it's an IgE-mediated response. So if you're allergic to penicillin, peanut butter, Shellfish, okay. If you're if you have a, a gluten allergy, a true gluten allergy, like celiac patient. Um, if you are allergic to bees, bee pollen, bee stings, wasp stings, ant bites, okay. Bermuda grass, <coughs> olive trees, pet dander, right. The list, can, you know, mold, fungus. I mean, the list goes on, right. This is all IgE-mediated response. IgG, this is a monomer as well. It's in the highest concentration in the blood of all of the circulating ones. 80 to 85% of all circulating immunoglobulins are IgG type. It readily crosses the placenta, so it, it transmits from mother to baby, developing infant developing uh, embryo, and it also readily uh, crosses uh, the barrier um, when you filter and make breast milk. So this is the IgG monomer, are the IgG antibodies that if a nursing mother is going to decide to do that, they're going to be delivering those antibodies directly to the infant. That's the IgG family. Then the last one's the biggest in size, it's a pentamer. Um, and it's usually secreted in the primary immune response. That means the first time you see it. So if we look at the pictures of these, sometimes the pictures help. So you can see, here's our pentamer, right? IgM, the biggest one. These are all monomers, and then this is the dimer. So you can see the monomers have a valence of two. And the dimer has a valence of four, right? And then you can calculate out, obviously, what the IgM pentamer is what? Valence of, well, two times five would be what? I know we're in biology, so math is usually low on the list. You can use your phone if you need to. <laughs> All right, let's take a quick break.